Thank you, Sarah. It probably would be more accurate to say that the Leadership Institute has been my friend for a number of years. Um, when I was a student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, we had uh, our funding cut off, uh, not by the school, we didn't accept money from them, but by a group that is now defunct in Washington. And one of the groups that came to our aid at the time was the Leadership Institute, and this is uh, probably 10 years ago. Um, they gave us some money and we were able to continue uh, printing. So uh, even 10 years ago, a lot of the stories that uh, Rich was, was talking about, that was certainly going on back then, and I'm glad to see that the Leadership Institute is still helping out student publications all around the country, because they certainly helped me, and that helped my writing, and now I have a uh, book out by a major publisher. My, um, my talk is, is called, I mean, my, my talk is the same title as the book, Why the Left Hates America. Um, certainly a, a good morning if, if uh, you're a Republican, uh, may not be such a good morning if you're a Democrat. What I'm here to speak about has some relevance to what ha happened last night, but a lot of the issues, um, a lot of the ills that, that uh, I talk about in the book really aren't going to change overnight if one party or the other is going to win. It, it's more than politics. It goes beyond that. It uh, involves religion, culture, entertainment, all sorts of things. But I don't think what, what happened last night can hurt. Um, it's great to be here for a number of reasons, one of which is that over the course of the past couple of years in researching the book, I have um, primarily spoken and, and, and conducted interviews amidst some pretty, um, some pretty despicable people, and I'm usually not in front of an audience of folks that uh, is predisposed to at least agree with, with part of what I have to say. A couple years back, the Leadership Institute sponsored a lecture of mine at, at uh, the University of California, Berkeley. And here's some laughs, some folks know what's coming. Before I was even, um, before I even said my first syllable, there was an orchestrated campaign to shout me down. My uh, words basically weren't traveling back past the sound barrier in the first couple of rows because there was a screaming and yelling throughout the entirety of the speech. The speech was cut short prematurely. Um, there were stu one student uh, rushed the stage, tried to rip the microphone cord out of the wall. Uh, another student mooned me, and I'm, I'm hoping no one in attendance today will will uh, will do that. And after the event, they had a Nazi-style book burning, and this, of course, was at the supposed home of the free speech movement of the 1960s, which uh, I guess the irony was lost on these folks. In front of the Supreme Court a couple of years ago at, at a left-wing rally while I was doing research and interviewing some of the activists, I was physically attacked twice. Um, it was a couple of aging hippies, and I'm a former Marine. I'm, I can't say that, that I felt that my life was threatened, but obviously any time that you're, you're attacked, it's not a very pleasant situation. And I was attacked twice. They actually drew blood. Uh, it was not very nice. I, more recently at, at uh, the University District of Columbia, I attended the 35th anniversary reunion conference of the Black Panther Party. And uh, as you can imagine, I stuck out like a sore thumb. And <laughs> some of the questions that I asked were not, um, they didn't like them too much, let's put it that way. And on the third day of the event, I was kicked out and told that I would be banned hereafter from Black Panther reunions for life. And this was crushing, as you can imagine. And uh, so it's good to be uh, in front of an audience that uh, at least will be predisposed to agree with, with uh, what I have to say, because that doesn't happen too often. If you go to any of the Leadership Institute's uh, training programs on how to communicate and that sort of thing, uh, they'll probably tell you that you should probably start a speech out with a joke. And this presents problems to people like me, to, to the, the community of folks who are not funny. Um, and so I thought it would be good to, to let someone else tell the joke, and so I brought a, uh, a clip from a movie with me, and I wanted to play it. It's about 30 seconds. It's not a movie that would be on any conservative's um, list of, of 100 best movies or anything like that, but there is one part that I thought particularly relevant to what I have to say today. It's from Monty Python's Life of Brian, and Monty Python of course, is like the Beatles of, of comedy. So, okay. Now, obviously, I play that clip not necessarily because I thought it was a funny clip, but it was. But I think because it has a lot to do with, with what I'm talking about here today. Um, 
those guys were called the People's Front of Judea. And essentially, the, the movie is, is uh, in one part, kind of a movie against religion and God. Uh, the part that I stressed there was obviously the part which uh, parodied extremist groups. And America has its own People's Front of, of Judea. They're called the left. And in a lot of the same kind of uh, talk that you heard in that scene, you can hear from the left, at least from, from the John Cleese character. We, um, we saw certainly evidence of this after 9-11. Um, I'm sure a lot of these, these examples are things that, that some of you have probably heard in the past. Um, at Brown University, there was a speaker following 9-11. He said, the American flag is nothing but a symbol of hate and should be used for toilet paper for all I care. A uh, University of Colorado student on 9-11 simply maintained, we had it coming. We are kidding ourselves into thinking we've been wronged. This is a, a student columnist at Wake Forest. Sometimes it is our fault. That is right. America is not a nice country. And my personal favorite, which I think uh, is quite a bit like what John Cleese had to say in the movie, was from John Walker Lind. And this, of course, uh, it occurred in a, an email exchange he had with his mother before 9-11. And he, he said, I, don't, I really don't know what your big attachment to America is all about. What has America ever done for anybody? And that was essentially the, the question that, that uh, John Cleese asked in the movie. And so in the, in the spirit of the People's Front of Judea, I mean, how what might we answer John Walker Lind? Um, I think the folks on the, on the movie screen did it right when, when talking about the Romans. And how, how what might we answer about our present situation, about the United States? I think you can first look to, to something like uh, technology. Look at, uh, and this is a quite obvious thing, you look at the VCR that we use in the room, the TV, these are things that were invented by Americans. You look at the telephone, uh, the light bulb, the internet, the space shuttle, you can go on and on. Uh, these are not things that were invented in, in Saudi Arabia or Nigeria or any other country in the world. They were invented here, and I think we can be proud of that. Immigration. Amer the left labels America as a bigoted and xenophobic country and all that sort of thing. Um, from 1820 to 1930, we took in 60% of the world's immigrants during that, that, that period of time. Uh, and today, we take in more immigrants than we did at that, that time. So the idea that we're some sort of um, racist country is, is disproven on uh, two levels. One, folks of all different skin shades want to get into this country. And two, obviously, there's um, not a lot done to keep them out. Uh, in, in fact, they're, they're accepted with, with open arms. Medicine, that was something that the, the folks on the, on the screen pointed out that the Romans had brought to them. And I think that's certainly, within the last century, people all around the world can, can credit the United States with raising the, the, the uh, health level and the life expectancy levels of everyone. About a week and a half ago, Ameri an American won a share of the Nobel Prize for Medicine. It was one of three people. It was two Brits and an American. This is the 45th time in the last 60 years that an American has won a share of the Nobel Prize for Medicine. And if you look at the past century, curing things like tuberculosis and polio, uh, creating vaccines for hepatitis B, uh, developing the MRI and the CAT scan, these are things that, that uh, people all around the world can, can certainly uh, celebrate. You look at um, the generosity of America. Since World War II, we've given more than $500 billion in aid to foreign countries. And this is not an inflation-adjusted dollars. This is an, uh, if you adjusted for inflation, it would be a lot more. This is roughly $500 billion more than the rest of the world has given to us. Um, the, right now, we give something like uh, $25 billion to, um, depending upon how you judge what is aid and what is not, we get, give about $25 billion to 130 foreign countries all around the world. Um, that's something that, that, that uh, is, is very uncommon in the world. And so the idea that we're kind of um, uh, taking the wealth of the rest of the world for our own advantage uh, has proven to be quite silly because, uh, in a way, the, the, the opposite is happening. Certainly, Americans could complain about being milked for the benefit of foreigners, but why are foreigners greeting the aid that we're giving them with, with burning American flags and uh, saying down with America and things like that as, as, the, uh, as the thank you? And I think, of course, the, the, the things that, that the world can, can certainly give us a thank you for more than anything else is, is freedom and self-government. 
we, um, I, I went to the Smithsonian uh, Museum of American History as part of my research for the book. And one of the, the exhibits was on the American founding. And the basic thrust of it was that the American founding was significant because um, people of color, women, the poor, and others were excluded from the franchise. Leaving aside for the fact, uh, the side of the fact that, you know, there were exceptions to this. Obviously, free blacks in several states could vote. There weren't property requirements uh, in every state at that time. Uh, women could vote in New Jersey up until uh, the early 19th century. The fact is that what's significant about the founding is that uh, anyone could vote. I mean, it was the case everywhere in the world in the late 18th century that people were excluded from the franchise. Only in America uh, and a few other isolated spots uh, were people allowed to vote. I mean, that's the significance of the American founding, and that gets lost on the left. Now, certainly, uh, this kind of anti-American hatred that, that I uh, touched upon a little bit briefly earlier didn't start with 9-11. Leadership Institute, my own organization, Accuracy in Academia, and another other, a number of other groups focuses quite a bit on the campuses and on students. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, on the campuses and how anti-Americanism is, is quite pervasive there. If you look at something like the ROTC program, which is a fight that I've been involved with for, for about eight, nine years to try to get ROTC back on a number of campuses, and we've had some successes. Um, a place like Harvard, which accepted $5, five million dollars from the Bin Laden family fortune, uh, but will not accept students who, who take money from the, f from the federal government to participate in their ROTC program uh, to meet on their campuses. They've got to go over to MIT. It shows you that, that some money, at least for Harvard, is just too dirty to take. It's not the Bin Laden money, it's, it's the uh, DOD money. Places like Yale are the same. Um, at UNLV last, last year, there was a uh, military recruiter, Marine recruiter, who came to the campus to speak to a group of students, and a, a gang of faculty and administrators barged in, blared some uh, TV uh, footage that they had on, on gays in the military, made noise so that the event could not happen. And indeed, the event did not happen, the recruiting uh, event. You can go on and on with examples. Earlier this semester at, at University of Massachusetts, uh, a young lady who was involved in the ROTC program would, received threats, had her door vandalized. So this sort of thing is, um, is not something that's isolated to a few Ivy League campuses. There's an anti-military bias that exists in, uh, in higher education. It used to be on the campuses that the folks who would be honored were people who helped build, build this country. Uh, people like Washington or Lincoln or Jefferson or whoever. More often than not today, the folks that are being honored are people who hated this country, who tried to destroy it. At my own alma mater, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, they have a 26-story library named in honor of W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, Du Bois was a guy who renounced his citizenship, who went to Kwame Nkrumah's Ghana and uh, lived there for, for the last few years of his life, joined the Communist Party. When Stalin died, he eulogized Stalin as a great and courageous man. And even for a time, he promoted racial separatism. And that got him kicked out of the organization he helped found, the uh, NAACP. He won the Lenin Peace Prize. A Ma a Maoist China had a national holiday in his honor in 1959. If it were some communist country that wanted to honor Du Bois, that would be, be fine, but it would seem strange, and I, I would submit that he's probably rolling in his grave thinking that uh, the United States of America has honored him in such a way, and UMass is, of course, not the only campus, Harvard, Penn, University of Hartford, a whole number of schools have, have uh, named buildings and institutes uh, after him. At Bard College in New York, there is an Alger Hiss professor of social studies. <laughs> I'm not going to get into who Alger Hiss is because you folks look like a pretty enlightened crowd, but uh, safe to say he was not a good guy. <laughs> At the City University of New York a few years back, and this is my favorite one, and thankfully it's been discontinued, there was a Ho Chi Minh scholarship that was given uh, to over a dozen students, and this was appropriate, who could maintain a C average. <laughs> They were given $500. <laughs> and you, 
can go on and on. I mean, the left talks a great deal about diversity, but the diversity that exists on college campuses is a diversity where you have a faculty that looks like the United Nations, but thinks like a San Francisco coffee house. That's to say, it's a fraudulent kind of diversity based on superficial characteristics. Certainly, intellectual diversity is non-existent. And one of the results of this is a fervent anti-Americanism. We saw this after 9-11, but even if 9-11 had never happened, we would have uh, seen this on the campuses. We also see it in Hollywood, obviously. Uh, recently, Woody Harrelson wrote a ridiculous op-ed piece in the Manchester Guardian. Uh, Sean Penn's ad a few weeks ago in, in uh, uh, in the Washington Post, an open letter to President Bush. Right after 9-11, Danny Glover said that uh, one of the main purveyors of violence in this world is America. And that was his response to 9-11. Everyone else was hanging up a flag or giving money or feeling grief or sympathy. And his response was to go out and speak on a campus and say one of the main purveyors of violence in this world is America. And others were even more harsh. Robert Altman, the director uh, of MASH, more recently of Gosford Park, uh, over in England, he said the American flag makes him sick, and the reason that America is fighting the war on terrorism was to pr protect their oil interests in, our, in Afghanistan, which was kind of strange given the fact that in the region, Afghanistan is one of the few countries that has no great oil reserves or anything like that. Certainly compared to their neighbors, they, they do not. Um, and that seems to be the kind of knee-jerk response you get to anything that goes wrong, wrong in the world, um, that it's oil or that it's America's fault. And I think that's my basic problem with the left that I outline in the book, that we're Americans, we have First Amendment rights, uh, everyone's free to criticize their country, and in some sense, some, sometimes criticism of, of your country is what improves your country. But the left, it's not so much criticism as it is knee-jerk, reflexive criticism that you can count on. Whatever the problem in the world, whether it's uh, debt in Africa or folks that, that uh, need jobs in South America or some sort of ecological catastrophe halfway around the world, the fault is always America. It's a Blame America course that we hear uh, whenever something happens. And we, we saw this after 9-11, even though no amount of mental gymnastics could, could um, change the fact that we were attacked, we were the victim, and yet some on the left celebrated the attacks, others justified it, gave reasons why the attacks happened, basically put the blame on America. Now, what's, what's the left's problem? I think the left's basic problem um, is that they compare America to an ideal. They don't compare America to what actually exists in the world. When you, when you compare America to, you compare anything to a utopia or an ideal, it's going to fall short. But if you compare America to what actually exists in the world, uh, we look rather exemplary. You look at a place like China, there is a uh, 117 boys born for every 100 girls that are born in China. Every year there's about 7,000 dowry killings in uh, India, in Africa. According to the United Nations, there's over 100 million women who have been culturally coerced into undergoing female genital mutilation. Um, most countries, most people who live in the world today live in countries where the private broadcasting of the news is illegal. This is different from America. This is not it's not just different, it's worse. And uh, judicial amputation, uh, the remnants of, of slavery in Africa. Uh, in Bangladesh, there were, in the year 2000, there were 2,130 rapes in the, in the country that were reported. Most of them probably don't get reported. There were 63 convictions. Imagine that, 63 convictions. So what I'm suggesting is, is that what goes on outside of our own borders does not reflect the kind of idealized utopia that you'll hear from multiculturalists and others. A true multiculturalism would inspect, evaluate, and judge what goes on in other countries. Um, but that doesn't what happens. Multiculturalism is really about uh, debasing our own country. It's not about uh, appreciating others. That's that, at least how it works on, on America's campuses. There was a quote that I... Um, have in the book that I particularly liked relating to the subject. And it, there was a guy named Charles Napier who um, was a conqueror uh, in the British Empire, conquered the Sindh, which is a por par part of India at the time, um, is now essentially present day Pakistan, at least part of it is. And he encountered something that really offended his English gentlemanly sensibilities, and that was uh, the sati, the, the practice of. Uh, 
brides being thrown on their husbands' funeral pyres upon the deaths of, uh, of their husbands. And he didn't like this and said, look, this is, uh, this is going to stop. I'm the conqueror here. You, you can't keep doing this. Uh, we're going to impose uh, some rules on you, and this is one of them. And the local Brahmins and other folks kind of got upset with this. And they said, no, this has been going on for thousands of years. Uh, this is uh, tradition. This is custom. To which Napier responded, my nation also has a custom. When men burn women alive, we hang them. Let's, let's all act according to custom. And at least in the area that he controlled, um, a lot of those practices uh, diminished greatly. My point in relaying this story is that today, the mantra on campus is who's to say? The villain in this story, uh, or the mantra amongst the left, is who's to say? And the villain in this story would not be uh, the Indians who were throwing their wives on, uh, or their women on, on to the funeral pyres of their husbands, but was this English general who was imposing his view of, of morality on the locals. And I think that says a great deal about the left, that they're willing to defer to ideology uh, and not do any critical thinking on their own. And that speaks a lot of what we saw after 9-11, where people just had this knee-jerk response and, uh, and blamed America. They didn't do any critical thinking. They just uh, blamed America. And it's the same thing with, with the, their view of history and, uh, and a number of other things. The book, obviously, the title is, is Why the Left Hates America. And obviously, that begs the question, why does the left hate America? And I'll give you the, um, if you want the, 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 uh, the long version, you can buy the book, and I'll be glad to sign it after the event. But I'll give you the short version here. I think the left hates America because America stands as a massive refutation to everything that the left holds dear. What I mean by this is that um, the left says capitalism is a failed economic system. But if you look at America, America is the largest free market country in the world. It's also the richest country in the world. It's a pretty stunning uh, rebuke to, to what the left has to say. The left hates religion. Specifically, they hate Christianity. They say that Christi Christianity is an intolerant religion. But if you look at America, people of all faiths can practice their religion here. You look at countries run by men of other faiths, and uh, that same, same tolerance is not reciprocated. You're, you're not going to be able to, to practice your faith abroad in many places, certainly outside civ uh, Western civilization in many instances. The left says, and I'm sure you've heard this before, the left says that America is a racist country. Um, why then, how, how would leftist ideology explain the fact that a couple of weeks ago, a couple hundred Haitians packed on to this ramshackle wooden boat that ran aground in the harbor in, in, in Miami to come to this country? According to the left, it should be, um, the Haitians should be leaving this country and going over to Haiti because, of course, that country is run by, by men of the same skin shade and there's no racism and that sort of thing. Um, but that didn't happen. You know, how does the left explain the fact that uh, every decade, we have tens of millions of people try to get into this country, uh, and, and most of these folks are people of color. Are these folks, are these guys trying to get into this country masochists? I mean, seriously, what would explain their desire to come to a racist, oppressive, uh, bigoted country, as the left uh, says? And this, you can go on and on. The, the central tenets of the left, what they tout in theory, the American experience refutes in practice. And for people so passionately attached to theory, this is a very bitter pill to swallow. And so rather than revising their inept theories, they lash out at the one country that, that uh, disproves them. Now, if you, you listen to the left, um, America stands for uh, the slave master's whip, uh, the massacre at Milai, Matthew Shepard, lifeless body hanging from a fence post in Wyoming. That's the America that the left views. And of course, all these things happened. That is part of America. But most Americans view America differently. They view uh, things like the, the soldiers sticking by Washington through the winter at Valley Forge. They view the, the 13th Amendment, the, uh, the promise at Ellis Island that immigrants coming through there see. Edison turning out the lights, Lindbergh touching down at La Bourge, the, the soldiers storming the beaches at Normandy, uh, the, the, the miracle in Jonas Salk's lab 
Reagan saying, tear down this wall. I mean, that's the America that we all know. Um, and rather than uh, uh, rebutting the left's version of history with uh, you know, a, a, a jingoism and, 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 and uh, that sort of thing, I think the truth will simply suffice because more than any other country, Americans have a lot to be proud of with regard to the truth. Are there problems? Were there things that went wrong? Certainly. But more than any other country, we have a lot to be proud of. And uh, uh, this is certainly not the case in other countries. In other countries, you have um, governments and people that uh, inflate the virtues of the nations but uh, downplay the vices. In America, just the opposite occurs. I mean, if you look at, at the Soviet Union, they wouldn't tell their, their people about the millions of folks that Stalin and Lenin and others had killed, but they would say that they invented the television and a lot of other nonsense. Uh, in Turkey, uh, you have denial after denial of the, the Armenian genocide during the Ottoman Empire. In, uh, in Japan, you go to a Japanese schoolhouse, you think you're going to hear a lot about the uh, rape of Nanking or Pearl Harbor or um, uh, the Tan Death March or any of the, the bad things that they did during World War II, you're not going to hear any of that. America is different. Uh, we, we unfortunately uh, are bad at PR. We inflate our vices and we, um, we exaggerate the, the bad things that have happened and uh, we downplay a lot of the good things. I want to um, close with a couple of uh, quotes that I'm particularly fond of. Um, the first was by a, um, a cartoonist that probably folks older than me remember, but folks my age probably don't, a guy by the name of Walt Kelly. And about 30 years ago in his uh, cartoon Pogo, and he, I think he was talking about Earth Day or something, but he said, we, he had his character Pogo, said, we have met the enemy and he is us. And I think that's relevant to what we're going through, through now. Certainly there are folks in foreign countries uh, that pose a grave threat to America, uh, Al-Qaeda being one. And I don't want to downplay any of that stuff because those guys need to, to be taken care of, the people that uh, uh, want to wage a terroristic war against this country. But I think the, the, um, one of the large problems is, is this internal rot rather than any foreign enemy that serves as the long-term threat to this country. And after we take care, or you know, while we're taking care of Al-Qaeda and, and all those other folks, let's not forget that uh, there is a challenge within this country. And the enemies of this country, many of them, are our fellow countrymen. Um, they're not a statistically significant portion of the population. They may be 10% of the population. But their, their small numbers belie a massive cultural influence uh, particularly in, in places like the media, in the universities, in the museums, in libraries, in Hollywood, um, any institution that essentially has a great impact on society, the left has gotten into and uh, has tried to use these institutions to destroy this country. Finally, I want to um, I want to close with a quote that I'm particularly fond of that Jean Kirkpatrick made a number of years ago, and I think Americans would be wise to heed her message. Uh, particularly folks on the campuses, and that is that uh, Americans need to face the truth about themselves, no matter how pleasant that truth is. Thank you very much. And <laughs> appreciate it.